you know what I did there? Tell I me. Pressed, I pressed <laughs> the wrong button. You didn't notice it was that was actually the outro credits. <laughs> Amateurs. Amateurs. <laughs> oh, there's no help in you, guys. See, absolutely no, 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 no help in you whatsoever. Listen, I am going to put it down to a little bit of nerves because there's a gentleman in the yep. green room who i been wanting to get on for a little while. We crossed paths a, a couple of months back and he, he's someone that is, and I, I personally think, and, and he's, I know he's, he's going to be very humble about what I'm about to say, but the night, the word legend, I think is attributed to an awful lot of people that in my opinion, don't deserve it. The gentleman is sitting in the green room. In my opinion, he is a legend. He's a West Ham legend. no, no shadow of a doubt, and he, he will he will be very bashful, I'm sure. But Mr. Tony Carr, the legend that is Mr. Tony Carr, how are you, sir? I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to this evening. Good, good, good. Glad to hear it. So, um, yeah, so, so Tony, um, obviously one of the, the reasons, well, the reason why you and I cross paths is because a couple of months ago, you was in a bookstore um, and you was there for a for a particular reason, Tony. What? Why? Why was you in this bookstore? I wonder. Yes, um, I just uh, had a book published, um, which was basically my autobiography, and uh, by Icon Books. And um, this was a book signing at Newham Book Bookstore in up uh, in the Barking Road, just by the by, by the Bowlin. Mm. So um, you know, it was a labour of love. I mean, it was um, something that I felt I'd finished at the club. My time is, is basically was done and it was time to now to reflect, which I'd never really done before because um, people would just say, well, why don't you do that? I said, well, no, I ain't finished yet. You know, I'll, I'll look back and, and, and reflect on what I have or haven't achieved, you know, when I'm done and, you know, when it's done and, and I'm finished. So I thought it was a good time. Obviously, COVID helped because loads of us had time on our hands. And um, so... I started from my childhood where I grew up in, in uh, council estate in Bow. and uh, was a West Ham fan as a kid. Um, was lucky enough to play for them as a young apprentice and a young professional. Never, never made the first team, but took a coaching route and ended up back at the club. John Lyle asked me to go back and uh, come back and be part of what firstly part time and then full time. And then my journey from there, really. So it was it was a journey that uh, started at St Paul's Way School in in uh, in East London and ended up uh, at the London Stadium at Stratford, which wasn't far from where I actually grew up. So I went full circle. So, yeah, I, I found it interesting to write, whether, whether fans or sports fans or anyone who, who's into sort of player development, youth development, young player development, I think will enjoy the book. But uh, that's for them to say, but... Uh, I've done my bit now. It's up to others to sort of decide whether it's worth a read or not. Well, I can I can safely say, and I've actually got, if anybody sort of wants to know what this book looks like, there, hang on, there we go. All right. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's the book. And if anyone wants the ISBN number, there it is on the banner, which will identify the book quite easily. Tony Carr, A Lifetime in Football at West Ham United. And I am... 104 pages in. I'm not the quickest reader, it has to be said. I tend to dip in and out. Um, but I, I've got to say that I've, I've, and I'm not just saying it because I've got you on, I'm saying it because I genuinely do. I've, I've found the book absolutely fascinating. Really, it's, it's, it's a very, you. very interesting read, Tony. And uh, credit to you. It's uh, ex excellent work. Yeah, I'd like to say it was all my own, it's all my own words. I didn't have a ghostwriter, I didn't have anybody else helping me. I spoke to people and they reminded me about things. And I thought, oh yeah, I'll put that in. I forgot that. But uh, <laughs> the the whole, from start to finish, it was my own words. Other than the interviews I did with the with the players that uh, are featured, um, I asked the questions which were my words again. And obviously it's their answers. But other than that, it was um, all my own work. And I'm quite proud of that fact. Good or bad, but I'm quite proud that I did it. You know, I wasn't sort of ghosted by anybody else. Did you find the, the process enjoyable sometimes at times it was, tire <laughs> it was tiresome because you 
the publishers, because I didn't have a publisher until very late, and I was talking to a publisher friend of mine, and he said, it's not enough. You've got to write more words. You've got to write, you know, you know, you need 80,000, 90,000 words. And I had about like 40. I thought, well, where am I going to go from here? So, you know, you, yeah, let's sort of, I put it down for a while and I left it alone for a month and then went back to it. Someone reminded me, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I, mean, I forgot that about that, that situation. And uh, so gradually and gradually, someone threw the idea into me, why don't you interview one or two of the players? Well, I ended up interviewing six and they were all great. You know, they were all really helpful. Um, everything I asked them to do, they went, yeah, where, where, where do you want us? We'll be there. Don't worry. Yeah. Come and interview me or whatever. And it was interesting, you know, the places I went to interview them. <laughs> that was interesting. And Mark Noble was one of the last ones I did, I think. And he just said, oh, meet me in a cafe in Brentwood. <laughs> we ended up meeting in a cafe and I just talked to him over a cup of coffee. So that was that was interesting. But yeah, that's typical Mark. But uh, no, it was, um, I found it very interesting and very humbling in, in terms of some of the comments the you know, the players made. You know, I didn't put words into their mouth and I've got some of their their quotes and comments on the cover of the book and that was their words that weren't me prompting them that was their words and I felt quite humbled and and uh, quite emotional I must be honest but some of the things they wrote because you, you never know how these people feel or, or, or felt about you until you ask them and mm. or they or they reminisce back uh, so that that was humbling and and uh, uh, quite enjoyable you know when I look back on it I think, mm. I didn't do too bad at all, you know. No, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's an understatement, Tony, to be honest with you. I think that no, really but, is an understatement. But I think that's that was that's part of my longevity, I think, that I was never I never rested on my laurels. I never said, Oh, I've done my bit, you know, that'll do and, and sat back and took a back seat. And I could have done. Uh, but I, I, I there wasn't a day I didn't enjoy going in. There was never a day I woke up and didn't want to go to work. And it was always me. And I always felt, because I didn't make it as a top player, I always felt in a, you know, in, in a, in a way that I had to prove, I keep, keep proving myself all the time. So it was always that challenge to you now be, be the best I could be and, and do better. And to, you know, you know, one player gets in the first team or we sell him for, you know, 18 million pounds or whatever it was. We know Rio was the first big, big one. And because uh, others had gone for two million and one and a half with Incy and Tony Cotty and people. And so they were, you know, decent money at the time, good money at the time. But Rio was like, wow, you know, and um, I, I, I always went, oh, OK, that's, he's passed on. Who, where's the next one? Who's the next one? Where can we find the next one? How can we polish this player? Out? How can we how can we get him in the team? How can we get him in the squad, etc.? So, you know, it was a process and. I thoroughly enjoyed doing it, I have to say, and I still miss it today. I, I really do. But there you go. Time I marches think, on. Absolutely. I, I think I saw it estimated somewhere, and I don't know how accurate it was, but they estimated that you, as far as the, the players that you personally produced through the academy system, was responsible for about £80 million worth of transfer going into the club. And as you say you have to sort of like appreciate that some of that would have been of its time. Like you say, two million pounds, I think it was Paul Lynch to Manchester United. Well, two million pounds now doesn't seem like a lot in terms of no, Premier exactly. League players going, but in, in and of its time, that would, that was huge yeah. money. And you do wonder what, I mean, a player like Paul Lynch now, what would he have gone for? 70 oh, million, yeah. 80? Oh, big, big money. Isn't he? It, big, big money. You've got to remember that was in the eighties and uh, there was no Premier League. It was just, you know, the, the football league as it as it was. Um, you know, Tony Cotty was two point two million to Everton. Um, that was big money uh, of its time, and Incy the same. Um, so yeah, I mean, you top them all up. And to be honest, many people have asked me this question: How much money have you made with a club? I can put my hand on my heart and honestly say, I've never ever sat and totted it up. Never ever. Never thought about it. I've, I've thought about individual transfer fees, but I've never sat back and think, well, let's trawl through the records and see how much he went for and how much he went for. And, you know, little, little other known factors that the boy from Finland, Daniel Sholand, who Harry moved on to uh, to Liverpool and we got Titi Kamara in, in place or someone like that. 
and um that I, I know exactly that's how I feel. <laughs> I, and, I, uh, I, Tony, I had his name on the back of my shirt for the for the year that he joined. It's it's not it wasn't my proudest moment because it was the Kamara shirt that I once had. Yeah, let's not yeah. uh let's, let's not, not go on that one. <laughs> now, and, Daniel, and, and we sold Daniel as part of it, the easy equation was 750,000 for Daniel. So, you know, he was just a youth player at the time. I was just, he was just broken out of the youth program. And Harry rang me up and he, I was in the car. He was rang me up. And he said, look, what Daniel Sholin, I've got a deal going on with Liverpool. He said, I can put him in exchange for 750,000. I said, Harry, it's a lot of money. He went, no, it's good, good money for us. He said, but I don't want to sell him if you feel that he's got a massive future with us in the first team. And, you know, he's worth, you know, a lot, lot more if I can get him in the first team in the next year. I said, I don't think he's ready for that age yet. But, um, you know, certainly if you, you know, if you, sell, if you sell him and it's part of a deal, you know, go ahead. You're the gaffer. I'll back you all the way. And he went, oh, thanks for that. And obviously, obviously, Daniel went on. Didn't quite hit the great heights at, um, at Liverpool and went back to Finland, I think. Yeah. Well, Tony, we'll we'll get stuck into it. We've got lots of people getting comments in the uh, the chat. So, um, Duke, do you want to get uh, the first question up on the screen, mate? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll jump out. I'll okay. jump out and leave you, gents, to continue this. I'll be a uh, uh, button monkey in the back. I'll jump back on towards the end, Tony, and, um, and I'll, okay. I'll, I might have a couple of questions of my own. But I'll jump out. I'll leave you with Rob, and I'll, uh, I'll press the buttons in the back and get the questions up so Rob can concentrate and... and and have his time with you, my man. I'll speak to you soon. Okay. Cheers, Duke. Cool. No problems. No worries. Then there was two. Yeah, okay, so two. Duke, if you could get the first question up in the live chat, please, for Tony. Uh, this is from Irish Tommy. How you doing, Tom? Hope you're well. Um, his question is, what player most surprised you who you thought would make it but didn't? Yeah, there's one or two that probably come into that category. Um, the first thing is you have a hunch on a player at a young age, but what you d can't see is the future in terms of how he's going to develop, the opportunity he will get, which is massive. And the manager of the time, whether he, f he, he sees anything in him, but, you know, like Lee Hodges, uh, I, I then even Frank says it, Frank Lampard, he said when Frank and Oji were in the youth team, Oji was far better than Frank, talented wise, talent, natural talent, mm. far better than Frank. And it was it was a dot on the cards that Oji could go on and play in the first team. He did a, I think he, had, he obviously did have a few games, didn't have many, but he had a few games. But he was plagued by knee injuries. Really bad. And he, I think he's still got problems today, sad to say. And I think that could tell his career. So there was a reason for that, but he didn't. And there was, you know, there was one or two others that uh, there's one player, young. I won't mention his name because it, it was a, might be a yeah. little bit embarrassing, you know, if, if word got to him. He, he was a prolific goal scorer in the academy. And this kid, whenever he played, you know, on the academy matches on Sunday mornings, you know, as a 12 year old, 13 year old, I mean, he would always score. And you think, oh, this kid's got talent. This kid can play. You know, he, he's a difference between winning and losing. So, for me, it was just a matter of him developing, maturing, and progressing through the age groups. Because every age group brings a different challenge. Hmm. The game gets quicker. From a very young age, the pitches get bigger. So, physically, you've got to be able to cope with that. You've got to be fitter, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in the end, the reason he didn't make it it wasn't because he didn't have the talent, but he didn't have the correct attitude and he didn't have, he didn't apply himself in the right way. What, not that he wasn't told by me many a time, but, uh, you know, he, 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 you know, he, he saw it his way. His parents saw it his way and they, it was their way or no way. And in the end, he, he drifted out and I think he's still playing in, in the lower league somewhere, but, he could have been a very, very good player for us, but it didn't work out. Uh, and, and there's one or two you could say in the same, you know, followed in the same vein mm. uh, in terms of not so much that it wasn't their talent or their physical attributes. It was maybe their attitude or their commitment or their desire. Mm. Or they, you know, they, they grew in, got into adolescence and 
got to 15, 16, 17 and, and saw other things other than football. And I, I, don't, I don't mean that in terms of interests, but, you know, outside interests in terms of, you know, girls, pubs, yeah. you know, maybe gambling or something that takes the eye off what you should be doing is concentrating on becoming a better player every day. You know, which those players that did go on and uh, make it big, and I mean make it big, had those attributes. I mean, they had their fun, don't get me wrong. It wasn't football, 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 nothing else. But when it came to football, you know, their, their attitude and their desire and their commitment was spot on. And that's that took them through their careers. So many, many fall by the wayside for those reasons. With um, Lee Hodges, I mean, you you referenced his his knee issue, which is essentially what curtailed his progress in the pro game. Yeah, was yeah. was that as a result of an injury that happened during a match in his in his infancy, or was it just sort of like a weakness that he had? Do you do you know what that was about? No, to be honest, I, I don't remember him getting a bad injury that that weakened the knee. Mm. But obviously, he must have remember these in the, you know in those days, and it doesn't affect everybody. These boys, when they're developing, they were playing morning, noon and night, every day, yeah. every Saturday morning, Sunday mornings, sometimes two games a day, you know, for you, because the system was different, slightly different then before the academy kicked in, you know, um, as it is today. But um, uh, and maybe it was uh, just wear and tear from mm. playing too much football at a young age. And he obviously had a, he developed a weakness in, it was in both knees in the end. Oh. And um, it could tell his career to, to go right to the top. But, uh, you know, he's still bouncy, bubbly, odgy. Um, but he, 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 could have been a, he could have been a very, very, very good player. OK. Um, Duke, we've got a couple of uh, people that have put video questions in. I believe the first one is uh, Budgie. So uh, roll VT, sir. Hi, guys. Um, Budgie from Green Street Leeds here. And uh, I've got a question for Tony Carr. Um, in your long and esteemed career at West Ham, um, is there any player out there that you've actually refused to work with because A, he doesn't work hard, or B, you don't see any prospect in there? Thanks, Tony. Now, right, obviously, okay. again, if, yeah. if, if you don't want to name names again, that's perfectly fine. No, that's fine. There, there's never been, never been a player that I'd refuse to work with. That's the first thing, because I'd always try until the very end, if, if you like, to try and make them see it the way I saw it. Mm. And I'm not saying that I know everything, but I thought the way I did things worked and it was, you know, good advice, good practice, good training sessions, etc., etc. That's in my opinion, of course. But there was always players that you felt could do a bit more. I mean, junior Stanislas is a good example. I mean, our junior, great talent, junior, great delivery with his uh, right foot, free kicks, shots, could bend the ball, could pass a ball long and short, had good pace, but didn't didn't have perhaps at a young age the attitude that he's, he was part of a team and had to work hard. He would always be holding a bit back. And now I had many a conversation with Junior, many, many a conversation. Come on, you've got to work. You've got, you've got, you've got enough to, to go all the way. But if you don't apply yourself, when it comes to the big time and you're with the big boys, so to speak, you know, you're going to fall by the wayside because they're going to go, hold on a minute, this kid don't do enough. He don't work hard enough. He's got talent, but don't work. He don't want to be a team player, et cetera, et cetera. And I had many a conversation with Junior, although he did play in the first team and played some you know, some decent games. I don't know how exactly his, his, how many games he had. And I saw Junior a few years later. He was playing for Bournemouth now. He'd gone round the yep. circle, gone to Burnley, mm -hmm. and he was playing for Bournemouth with Eddie Howe and Jason Tyndall. And um, he said to me, I wish I'd have listened to you when I was 17. He said, because I suddenly realised that if you don't work hard and apply yourself properly, you know, you don't get, you just don't get in the team or you don't, you don't get a career. He said, now I've got a young family. He said, I realise now that I've got, a, you know, I've got a commitment to my family and I've got a graft hard. And I just said to him, that's great, Junior. At least the pennies dropped eventually. So that's a great example of, you know, maybe younger he saw it differently and was yeah. a bit, you know, oh, oh, I know what I'm doing, etc. But later on, it, 
you know, the penny dropped. But um, I've never, ever, I've never refused a player and never said I'm not working with you anymore. I've had, I've had a few run-ins with players. I mean, Incy was one of them. I had a few run-ins with Incy, <laughs> like, like many people did. But deep down, he had great talent, and and it was a raw talent because he he always played angry. If he he played well, he had to play angry, um, as if he had a you know an axe to grind with whoever he was playing against or the mm. team he was playing against. And unless he had that, um, sometimes it boiled over and, uh, you know, even slagging his, his own teammates off, etc. So sometimes it boiled over. Yeah. But, um, but you always stayed with those people because you knew they had the talent. And you just hoped eventually that, you know, he'll see the lot. I mean, John Lyle was a big, big mentor of mm. Paul's, massive mentor of Paul's. And that was one of the reasons he wanted to leave West Ham um, in the way that he did because John had got the sack. And Ince, he went right arm off because yeah. John was John was like a a father figure to him, mm. and um, obviously we didn't like the way it was done. But uh, and I think if John had still been the manager, it no way would it have been done that way. He might have still gone to Man United, but it wouldn't have been done that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I remember someone told me that um, John Law was essentially like a, a surrogate father to Paul Ince, and yeah. had had what happened to John not come to pass it's quite likely Incy may have even stayed in, the, in yeah. the second tier. Who knows? But, you know, yeah. what's done is done. Um, Duke, there's a question on the banner. Uh, the first first one down, mate. Now, this is from, this is, this is because I paid attention in your book, Tony. Um, did your coaching qualifications in cricket, tennis, volleyball, hockey and swimming help you with your football coaching? And would you recommend this to football coaches today? Yes, I would in some, not all of those maybe, but <laughs> busy the, boy. The the reason that came about was because um, I was playing part-time football after leaving West Ham at Barnet. So I had to get a day job and I got a day job in, in a school, in two schools in North London because I had football qualifications. But if I wanted to work the summer months, I had to get a summer qualification. So that summer qualification ended up being cricket, tennis, volleyball, hockey, swimming. So I thought was I'll cover my water bases and I do all the courses. So over a period of time, I did all these courses. I was out every night of the week doing all these things, but uh, it paid off in the end. But what it does, it gives you an insight into other sports mm. and, 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 the, and the way, you know, you, you have to adapt your style and your manner to the sport that you're coaching. Uh, like tennis is an individual sport. Hockey was very similar to football. Tactically, was very similar. So that I could do that quite, quite easily. I couldn't quite master the, the stick, but uh, very well. But it, it, these are all elementary coaching courses to work with school children. And obviously, the cricket is a team game, and you have to learn the bits and bobs. But um, the reason, the reason I'd got a part-time job at West Ham, three years into my role at these at these schools and the reason I did this swimming was because swimming was two o'clock till three o'clock in the afternoons and after swimming you registered the the, the, the children that, who, who was with you mm -hmm. and they were free to go so you got away to 20 minutes earlier than school finished so they could leave from the swimming baths you know if they had pickups etc and um, and I chose to do swimming Tuesdays and Thursdays so I could get away early because I was working part time at West Ham. So I could get to, get to training at West Ham in the evening that little bit earlier. So that was the reason then I did that. But yeah, they certainly a help massively, massively a help in terms of understanding how to coach young kids, mm. you know. And you know that was in the end what I was doing. And yeah, it massively helped. Yeah. Now that 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 question I thought I put in just just so you knew that like, I have read your book. I'm not just paying <laughs> lip service to it. I I come across that and I thought, wow, I never yeah. knew that. Yeah, you so, didn't just read the football bits, then. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. As I say, yeah. I've 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 given it a good good thorough read. So, okay. So, do um, any more questions in the live chat, mate? Oh, now this one's from Neil Manning, and he asks, "Are you aware of a first year scholar called Lewis Orford?" Um, it's a name that escapes me. He may have been, I don't know whether he was there when after I left. He may have been in a very young academy uh, section there, like the, mm -hmm. the nines, tens, elevens, or something around those. 
and and I knew those players, but I wouldn't know any. I wouldn't know them very intimately, you know, because I didn't see them on a regular basis. But I have to say that um, if he was there when I was there, I've obviously come across him, but I don't, I don't remember him, and, and uh, I haven't seen much of him in the last couple of years. I have to say. Okay, but I know Kevin Keane speaks. I know Kevin Keane speaks highly of him because I, I often speak to Kev, who runs the eighteens, and he's he, he's quite. Um, He's quite upbeat about the players that's in the under 18s environment at the moment. Yeah. Because mm. the 18s, they're down at Chadwell Heath, aren't they? Yeah, the 18s and, and, uh, and under train at Chadwell Heath. And it's the sort of reserves under 21s, under 23s, whatever you call it these days, and the first team at Rush Green. Do you, do you get back to sort of like either Chadwell Heath or Rush Green at all? Or is that no. not something you ever. No, if I get invited, I'd go. I mean, if someone, I mean, Stuart Pierce, when he was manager, of the, manager, assistant manager of the first team, first team coach, invite, rang me up and said, come and have a cup of tea with us, you know. So I went down to Rush Green and had a cup of tea with the first team staff. And um, when they opened the new facilities at um, Chad Heath, they invited me along to the opening. And um, David Sullivan was there and he said, I bet you wish you had these facilities when you were here, didn't you? So I said, yeah, it'd be nice, uh, Mr. Sullivan, I said. I said, but it's still, it's about what goes out on the grass that matters. <laughs> I don't think Absolutely. you like that reply. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, okay, so we've got another um, video question, Duke. Hi, Tony. Uh, this is my question for you. Uh, over the years, you must have scouted lots of different players has there ever been one you've gone to for the first time to see and after five minutes thought that player will make it all the way to the top of the game? I wonder whether you can make a judgment that quickly on a player. Cheers. I should point out that Steve has got a face for radio. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, a good question. It's a good question. Um, it, sometimes it's not as simple as that, I have to say. And bearing in mind that I was more of a um, head of the academy and a coach. I was predominantly the coach. I mean, I did scout games. Of course I did. And watch players. But the one that I recall immediately you said that was Jack Collison. Because um, he was at Cambridge. And Cambridge uh, abandoned their youth programme. And he was a 15-year-old kid that one of our scouts in Cambridge said, there's two boys up in Cambridge that I think we should look at. So we put a game on at MK Dons. We played MK Dons away on a whatever it was, a Wednesday night. So these boys were going to play for, it was an under-15 game or something. And um, when, I, when I watched the game, within five minutes of the game, when I like him, I think I went with Jimmy Hampson. I, I nudged Jim. I said, I like him, Jim. He said, which one? I said, like the number eight in midfield, blonde boy. Keeps running forward, plenty of energy. Gets his foot in, tackles. Fantastic attitude. A little bit loose on his touch. I said, but we can we can improve that. We can we can get that better. And I, uh, what I couldn't have do, and, and I don't think anybody can really, is predict he will play in the first team or he will go on and play for England. Well, he played for Wales in the end, but he would go on and have it, be an international player. That is a very bold statement to say that. And sometimes you have to be very lucky that it does turn out. So all I would say was, one, he was good enough to come in and be straight into our programme. He was, you know, he stood out. And um, from a very early age, I thought, this kid's really got something because the game was getting more demanding in terms of being able to play box to box and the energy you required. And, and he had that in abundance. The thing that he lacked at times was just, you know, simple passing, one and two touch, which was, um, which was the... Um, the, you know, the important thing that we, we, we had to work on over a number of years. The other lad that played, um, he played right on the night. I didn't fancy him. I thought, no, we've got, we've got better than that already in the system. So it wasn't any point in bringing a lad in that wasn't going to, if you like, take the place of the boy we already had. So we didn't, we, we didn't pursue that. He had the trial, but we didn't pursue it. And I think he, I think he got a, a scholarship at Norwich, I believe. Um, so he, he went on and, and had his chance. I don't know what happened to him because I can't remember his name, to be honest. Uh, but Jack was one that uh, you felt straight away. And I, and I suppose the one that stands out more than anything is Joe, Joe Cole. When, you know, he came in and played a game. You think, oh, my God. It, it just blew you away. 
he was like straight 13 away. or something. Straight away, you think, Christ almighty, this what's, it's unbelievable, this kid. And um, then you thought, well, he's, he's got everything you required to be a player. All you needed was now a level head. I mean, he had the talent. It's whether he had the mentality, the commitment, the desire, and all those things that I spoke about just a little bit a while ago. And he had all that anyway. He was a you know, great lad, great lad. So there are two examples, and there's probably one or two more that I could probably recall. Uh, but uh, no, you, you can, you, you can, you have that instinct about, yeah, I like that. And you see traits in a player that, that you think that's, if he just keeps that trait and improves that yeah. trait, that'll be good enough. And then you obviously yeah, I mean, try to add and, and polish. Yeah, I mean, you hear the sort of like the, the term with players that don't quite make it, that you know, <coughs> that show promise in their early years. Uh, the the phrase they didn't quite kick on. Um, so yeah. yeah, I mean, you can never never tell. I mean, sort of like you see a kid at twelve, thirteen, and like you say, Joe Cole, you instantly saw and went wow. But as you say, if if at any point in the lead up to him becoming a pro, like you said, referenced earlier, taking your eye off your focus going somewhere else, whether it's girls, whether it's the pub or whatever. Do you know what I mean? They get to a certain age and, you know, things can just get in the way. Hmm? Has my internet dropped yeah, you're, out? Or you're is... breaking up a little oh. bit, Robert. You're breaking up a little bit. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, Duke, uh, next question in the live chat. Don't oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, Tony. They, they don't develop physically. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, sorry, can can Yeah, so I, I think it might have just been a little bit of interference. No, um, I just said sometimes they just that physically they don't develop and the game passes them by because it, Yeah, the the game passes them by because the game gets too physical and more too demanding. Yeah. And uh, okay. it's not for the want to try in sometimes. Yeah. Okay. So we've got another question in the live chat. Please do. Okay. Okay. So this is from Sharky. He says, evening, everybody. Question for Mr. Carr. How much did the academy system change during your time within the club? Massively, absolutely massively. Um, well, you got to remember when I first when I first started as a part time coach, we were in the winter months. We we're training up to park on the forecourt, so you plan on tarmac with plastic footballs. Wow! And uh, or you played it in the car park next door at the school, if we were lucky enough, you know. And if there was a car left on the forecourt overnight, sometimes it was. We'd just play around it. Um, and that was all, and, all, all, and, all, and the other facility we had was underneath the uh, West Stand, you know, where the bar was from the North Bank. You went under, we'd, we'd train under there using the walls, or we'd use it. Did it, 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 it you had to improvise, but you still taught skill, you still taught technique. And in the summer months, we'd go to Chabble Heath in the evenings. While it, while it was still light, you know, you could train while it was still light. Uh, and then obviously we were one of the first teams to have an indoor facility built. John built and got an indoor really? facility built at Chabble Heath. So we ended up, yeah, we were one of the first to do that. Okay. We were quite a small uh, indoor gymnasium, you know, quite a sports hall. And it's not, not like the big 60 by 40 sports halls they've got these days. So we did, it, was, it, it developed slowly, but what it didn't change was the way you approached your coaching or the philosophy. Because Ron Greenwood, all he ever said to me when he took me on as a part-time coach, he said to me, just do the things you did when you was here as a player. Just do that, he said. Pass, move, you know, play forward. Just keep it simple, but just concentrate on those basic things. And, um, you know, that's what I try to do throughout my career and, and added it and, you know, in the end became my own man and, and uh, developed as a coach, as all coaches do as they as they progress and get older. But it's changed massively. Now, you've got to remember, when I, when, even when I was full-time, I started in 1980 full-time. I was the only full-time member 
of the Youth Academy. Really? I was the only full-time member. We didn't even have a physio. Rob Jenkins was the physio, but he was the first team physio. So yeah. the youth team had, had to share Rob, and Rob would only fit in youth team players if they were, you know, in the afternoon when he had the spare time. And um, so it was very basic. We didn't even have a full-time scout until Weddy Bailey come along a few years later. Um, but no, it was um, very basic. But now, you know, the academy staff, I'm talking about full-time, just for the academy, there's 30 or 40, and some clubs have got even more. Full-time staff, coaches, sports scientists, fitness coaches, dietitians, welfare officers, education officers, you name it, they've got it. So any kid nowadays, he's got no excuse not to, you know, not to fulfil his talent or the the opportunities there for to learn everything he needs to learn to become the player he, he, he dreams he's, he wants to be or he's going to be. So, yeah, it's changed massively. And Support that, structures completely yeah, changed. That, that for me, gave me a problem when it started to change. Because mm. the problem it gave me was that I now had to manage all these members of staff, which, in, a, in effect, I spent less time doing what I was good at out on the grass, which I thought I was still out there. <coughs> but I had so many other duties so many other things I had to think about or problems that came my way that I didn't, you know, many, many years before that. Yeah. And I think, I think that detracted a little bit from my role, but um, I wouldn't have any different, but that's, that's how it changed. And the Academy managers these days don't tend to be coaches. They tend to be organizers, administrators, etc., yeah. rather than like a secretary, really uh, rather than the, well, I was the coach and, and the Academy manager, Academy director in the end. And I was still the coach, but uh, it's very, very hard to map, to put those two together now. Fair, fair. Um, we've got another video question that's come in. Um, it's uh, from Walshy. So, Duke, if you'd like to do the honours, please. Afternoon. Uh, Andy Walsh here. Quick question for Tony. Um, when you actually go to a game, Tony, do you ever actually relax and not, like, um, look at... Um, players and criticise them, good or bad, you know, just relax and enjoy it. So can yes. you switch off? If I go and watch West Ham, uh, I can't switch off. I'm, <laughs> I'm so overcritical. I I'll I'll, I'll sometimes go with my um, my bro um, brother-in-law, my wife's brother who's married and got a couple of kids and he's got four season tickets. We sit up behind the goal and the... Uh, and the is it the Bobby Moore end? I think it's the Bobby Moore end. Sit up behind the goal. And uh, I sit with all the punters, you know. And yeah. I'm, yeah, I get it. I die, I die. I'm getting involved because obviously West Ham, whatever I do in the future or wherever, West Ham's still my club and it will yeah. always will be. You know, you know, wherever you go, even if I go and work for Real Madrid, but well, uh, West Ham still be my club. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen, by the way. And um, <laughs> you never know. Yeah, you never know, I suppose. Yeah. But um, no, I can't, is the bottom line. I can't just be, unless we're 3-0 up and playing really well, and I go, oh, this is good. <laughs> Which don't happen very often. But, but when uh, you're watching other teams, if, it, if, if the result doesn't impact on West Ham at all, you, you, you can sort of like just sit back and relax in those situations, yeah, can you? Yeah, if, I, if I'm watching a live game on TV and it's like Fulham versus Man City, should we say, mm. I might be rooting for a little bit for Fulham because they're they're not, they're the underdogs. Yeah, but I'd be, I'd be very relaxed about it. I, I wouldn't get I wouldn't get emotionally involved, you know, in terms of a shouting at the TV. You know, I'd still will appreciate good good uh, good play, good movement, good goals, you know, good individuals performing. Uh, I'd still I'd still appreciate that, but uh, I wouldn't I don't get emotionally involved. And, and to be fair, I mean, I'll get emotionally involved watching West Ham a little bit but nowhere near as emotionally involved when I was actually working for the club because it, it was your, it was basically your livelihood. Yeah. Because if, if the first team did well, that created the right environment for the, re for, the, for the next week. And if West Ham lost or had a little run of losing a couple of games, the atmosphere the following week is, is always a bit, oh, you're not sure what Doom to say. And and, 
yeah, it's a bit doom and gloom and a little bit, you know, it's pressure from outside coming in, press, etc. cetera. But um, no, so I, I don't get as in, emotionally or involved as I used to. But I do it because I'm a supporter is the bottom line. Was there ever a possibility? I mean, I know you're you're from uh, Bo from your younger yeah. days. Um, was there ever any chance at any point that you might have gone to support, say, a, another London team, or you was always it was always destined you were going to be a West Ham boy through and through? Yeah, never, never, not, never a hesitation. It was always West Ham. It was never. There was one or two in. You know, we lived in the council estate, and there was always one or two that that supported Tottenham or one or two that supported Arsenal, but I was never tempted. Um, West Ham was always the team for me and uh, always will be. Good to hear. Good to hear. Um, I'm sure we've got some more in the live chat, Duke, if you want to get the next one up, please. So this is from Kent Hammer's regular contributor to the channel. Um, he asks, which player at the academy did Tony not think would make it as a player, but suddenly sprouted into a really good player. Mm. I would say that um, there there isn't a player that I felt, and you know, I said privately to the staff or to somebody else, and said um, he's got no chance. This kid, like, he ain't, he ain't got what's required, and then suddenly. Um, became a great player. But there was many a player that I had doubts about. Let's put it that way. Um, I, I never wrote a player off. I mean, these are your private faults, you know, in terms yeah. of him, he's got a lot to do. And, you know, he's only got a year to do it in. Really, I need to see a massive improvement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, Glenn Johnson's a good example, I think, of that. That I, 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 I could never see Glenn uh, doing what he did in terms of... Um, making that right-back spot his own, getting transferred to Chelsea, then to Liverpool, playing for England, et cetera, et cetera, and the journey he went on. Because he, he was just, he was just an average player within the academy, a good player, but an average player, not one that really caught your eye. He was a centre-half mostly for the youth team because though he wasn't massively tall, he could he had a fantastic spring. He could, you know, spring and head and, uh, the game was a, perhaps a little bit more direct then than it is today. And uh, he, he suddenly, he got put out on loan to Millwall. Went to watch him a couple of times in Millwall. He did okay. But didn't uproot too many trees. And of course, any West Ham player playing at Millwall is, is, a, is a challenge in itself because they hate West Ham, Millwall fans. So whenever Glenn made a mistake, they would have, all the Millwall fans would have a moan up. Uh, and he came back and he... Back into the reserves, and it was Glenn Roder's time at the club. And Glenn, it was the year we got relegated, and Glenn was struggling, really struggling. And uh, Glenn Roder said to me, Do you think Glenn Johnson could play right back? He said, I haven't got a right back. I've been playing Ian Pierce at right back. He's really, you know, a centre forward or a centre half. He said, And we haven't got a right back. And I just said to Glenn, Glenn Roder, I said, You'll never know until you put him in. And he put him in. And he was like a breath of fresh air because yeah. the rest of the team was struggling, lacked confidence. And um, he went on and did terrific up and down the wing. He played without, he played without fear in effect. And we, he always had great pace, always had great pace. And that showed. And uh, he never looked back after that. And obviously I think he only played about 15 games for our first team. Something like that. It wasn't very many. Yeah. It was, and Chelsea you know. bought him. Chelsea bought him. Yeah. And then his journey went on, from, Liverpool, uh, England, etc. Yeah. Was he one of the first um, uh, Mourinho signings, I think, for Chelsea? I think he was one of the first, I think. I, I'm not... Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah but no, he, he honestly didn't want to go. He came up to me. No, and I know. Well, the well funnily enough... Great. He, he didn't want to go. Well, funnily enough, Duke, when he comes back in, he might have a story to tell you about because he's he came across the path of uh, Glenn Johnson around about that time. So, but he'll he'll probably have a little yeah. conversation with you later because he's he's from Dartford, which is where I'm. Yeah, where I Glenn's live at the from. Moment, yeah. And where, yeah. So, yes. Um, 
have we got uh, another video to play, Duke? Oh, good evening, Tony. Hope you're well. Um, Paul here. Just a, just a really quick question for you. Given all the players that you've developed so fantastically over the years at West Ham, I've got one quick question about a very specific player, and that's Alan Dickens, who I always felt was very underrated as a player, had great vision, great touch, um, really kind of could read the game really well. Um didn't really go on, I don't think, to fulfil his potential. I'm just wondering whether, you know, you think that the whole next Trevor Brooking label that he grew up with actually worked against him and hindered him, the great expectation that he had. So, uh, yeah, just wonder what your thoughts on it. OK, thanks a lot. Yeah, it's a good question. Funnily enough, I was with Alan Dickens on Sunday. I was at a charity match that uh, someone had asked me to go to for a, a leukaemia. The young lad had died of leukaemia. And I went to the game and I, I was, Alan Dickens was there as one of the guests as well. And um, I spoke to Alan, but yeah, going back to the, the original question, um, it was during Lou Macari's uh, time at the club. He'd just come to the club and he didn't know Alan Dickens. His contract was running down and Chelsea put a bid in for him. Now the story behind Chelsea putting a bid in for him was um, Greg Campbell was an ex West Ham player. And Bobby Campbell, his father, was the manager of Chelsea. And Greg had, Greg had left the club by now, but he had said to his dad, go and get this young player at West Ham, Alan Dickens. Really, really good player. And so it transpired that they put a bid in. West Ham refused the bid. So we had to go to an FA tribunal to sort the fee out. I'll come back to the original question in a sec. But this is the story, the background story behind it. And Lou McCarry never knew anything about Alan. He said, oh, I ain't got a clue what Alan Dickens is worth, what he's like. He said, you go to the tribunal, pointing at me. I'm like, oh, thanks. I'm only the youth team coach. <laughs> anyway, so he sent me to the tribunal. I went with a chairman, uh, Mr. Mr. Kearns. I didn't go in his car. He told me to get the train and meet him there. <laughs> so that was at Lancaster Gate. So I got a train there and we did the deal. Um, and it was we got 635000 for him, which was a really good fee. And the chairman was really, really pleased. And I spoke to Alan uh, when it didn't get work out for him a few years later. Not, I didn't speak to him Sunday about it, but it, he said that when he was at West Ham, it was such a great environment, a family atmosphere. Everybody was behind you. Everybody encouraged you. John Lyle knew everybody's name from the youth team to the first team. He knew everybody's name and there was a problem. He'd look after you. So you always felt as if you belonged there. You were part of it. It was a family atmosphere. And I, so I think that's overquoted sometimes, but it was. It was. And um, everybody um, looked after each other. Everybody looked after each other's back, et cetera, et cetera. He said, when I went to Chelsea, the first day in the dressing room, he said, he said it was like silent. No one spoke to me. He said, went out to training. He said, it was like no one would pass the ball to me. He said, I, he said, I couldn't believe it. He said, right. and I didn't, and, and he, Alan hasn't got the personality, like an incy, shall we say, that would go and start effing and blind and go, give me a name. Alan was very, very um, laid back in that way. And he didn't have that, if you like, um, aggressive, if that's the right term, personality. He was... Um, you know, he, he played the game in, you know, give me the ball, I'll pass it. Give me the ball, I'll, you know, score the odd goal. I'll make, I'll make, I'll make an assist and score. Because he was a great passer, the ball, had great vision, could see long and short. Um, didn't have great pace, but decent enough pace. Good, good player. But I think he went to Chelsea and it was such a culture shock that he didn't have that personality to overcome it. Maybe you could call it mental strength, I don't know, or maybe just, he just went, oh, Christ, I ain't going to fit in here. He said, and from a, about a week or two, I realised I made a massive mistake. He said, and that, that's why I never I, I never did it there. And when he left Chelsea, he was so disillusioned with the game, he more or less drifted out of the game. And uh, that was the story behind Alan. But a good player. If he'd have stayed at West Ham, he would have been a much better player because he'd have grown up, he'd have matured more, um, whether Lou would have liked him. But Lou only lasted nine months or whatever it was. So Bonzo would have took over at the time. 
and Bonzo would have appreciated Ditko and he, I'm sure he would have become a better player than he became. It's a shame because he's a good lad. Taxi Do driver now. <laughs> Yeah, I heard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you do you think um, he he suffered as as Paul alluded to? Do you think that the burden of being tagged the the new Trevor Brooking weighed heavy on his shoulders? Was that sort yeah, of like part of the problem? Yeah, he, he wouldn't have liked that. He he wouldn't have liked that comparison because they're two different people. It was like Kevin mm. Lott with Bobby Moore because Kevin yeah. was blonde. You know, it was simple as, and uh, Kevin overcome it. But, but Dicko didn't like that. I know he didn't like that, and. Uh, because he always felt he had to play up to Trevor's standards. And, you know, he was a young player learning the game and he wasn't going to do that. Um, occasionally he did. And, you know, if I remember rightly, he scored on his debut at Notts County, if I remember rightly. I came back a bit there, but that's just sprung it in my head. But, uh, yeah, I think that didn't help him, I'm sure. Yeah, fair. Thank you, Tony. Um, we're going to go back to the live chat now. So, Duke, if you've got another question in the live chat, you can pop up on screen for us, please. Luke Legend, uh, how bonkers was Stephen Bywater? <laughs> you instantly smiled there, Tony. Yeah, he, he was he was a bit strange, uh, Steve. Yeah, good goalkeeper though, but um, occasionally prone to error, as it showed on one of his yeah. debuts versus Bradford five four. I think that I tells the story, um, which you know didn't do him any good. But in our FA Youth Cup run. Again, when we won the Youth Cup with Joe Cole, Michael Carrick, Stephen Bywell, Richard Garcia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Adam Newton, Sean Byrne, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. some some good good players. Um, we played at Stockport, and we we got drew away in every round. Every round we got drawn drawn away. Uh, so and, and obviously we won it in the end with by a record score. But we played at Stockport, and I think we drew. And in the last couple of minutes of the game, someone's hit a shot from outside the box. And it's going right in the top corner. And he's pulled out a save, Stephen Bible, out the top, real top to his right, and pushed it round the post or over the bar, one or the other, in the last couple of minutes of the game. Which, in effect, might have and we might have gone out the cup at one of the early stages. I think it ended up a 2-2 draw. And uh, I think we beat him comfortable in the replay. But... Uh, you know, Stephen had his moments, but he was a little bit bonkers. But uh, a lot they say all goal. I mean, no, no more bonkers than Jimmy Walker or people like that. Jimmy's bonkers, isn't he? You know, and 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 the only sensible one I've ever come across, really sensible goalkeeper, was Ludo Ludo Miklosko. Really? He comes from near Moscow. Very straight, very laced. You know, straight laced. Did it right. Trained right. Clent his own boots. Real good professional. Really Eastern good land. European efficiency. Eastern European efficiency, and uh, yeah, yeah. Most, 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 um, most importantly, a good goalie. Fair. Um, I've got a question I put up on uh, the banner. So, Duke, if you want to get the next question up, this this is one that I wanted to ask you, and it's 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 your opinion on something that I think a lot of West Ham fans, um, sort of like wonder about in your opinion why did neither the fa or west ham embrace bobby moore like the dfb and bayern unit embraced franz beckenbauer that's a mystery to everybody i think i mean harry redknapp still carries that banner today you know every opportunity he gets to mention it he mentions it but the ball uh, to be honest i think they were frightened of him frightened of his fame frightened frightened of him in terms of, um, I don't know whether I'm not. I'm not sure they would be open to a, a role for Bobby, or mm. whether it was an ambassadorial role, a, a director of football role. I don't know, but they certainly should have done. Mm. I mean, the FA did later on, um, you know, with a statue at Wembley, but far, far, far too late. And West Ham embracing Bobby far, far too late. Um, you know, in terms, you know, the, the story goes, he pulled in the car park at Upton Park one night and they turned him away because his name wasn't on the list. Scandalous. Absolutely scandalous. And it wasn't the steward's fault, but that was his orders. Yeah. So he just didn't use his common sense. But that is so sad. I mean, David yeah. Sullivan always says he gave him a job, didn't he? Because he, he owned the paper, The Daily Sport. Yeah. 
uh, and, and as much as what else they had in the paper, was um, they had a sports section and um, they employed Bobby. So David Sullivan always says, well, I employed Bobby more when he was out of work and struggling. And, um, but it's so sad. It, you know, and they make him an icon now, but, mm. you know, it's nice for his family, you know, his daughter Roberta and his wife and his ex-wife. It's lovely for them, but uh, you know, should Bobby should have enjoyed a lot more of that adulation than he than he did. And he was a very humble man. He was a very quiet man. He he wasn't one to really push himself in terms of you know who you know do you know who I am sort of thing. He he was never like that. He was a very mm-hmm. quiet person. He had few friends. He had loads and loads of acquaintances, but very very few <clears throat> close friends. And uh, it's so sad. And I don't know the reason why, to be honest. I really don't know. Yeah. And it, it, really... It's crazy, isn't it? Because his German equivalent was yeah. was made West West Germany as it was then their manager, won them the World Cup. Yeah. Uh, I believe he managed Bayern Munich, Bayern Munich for a spell. He was their president. Yeah. I mean, they, they rolled out the red carpet for him. And yet yeah. neither the FA or West Ham, you know, I can't say it's just West Ham. It was the FA were just as culpable in... Yeah. essentially turning their back on on Bobby Moore, who's still the, the, the only World Cup winning captain that England I think produced. The, I think the Kearns family that were, were, you know, were in charge of the club at the time, um, I mean, I knew them, but I, mean, I didn't know them intimately. I wasn't at board mm. meetings listening to what goes on. But I just think they didn't know what to do with him. I, I think they didn't know what to do. They just didn't have that, have that insight. And they weren't really what one would call football people. I mean, Martin Kearns was a banker, nothing wrong with that. Len Kearns was a, uh, had a, a building firm. Reg Pratt, who was the chairman at, for a period of time, was at a timber business. And uh, the other Kearns, Will Kearns, was a, was a solicitor. So, you know, they, they, they weren't really football people. They were the local businessmen that ran a football club. I don't think they knew how to handle Bobby. I really don't. I, or, or what to do or what, what role to give him. I don't know. I really don't. That's my own just guessing. I don't know. Just like, I think, like you say, maybe they were just scared. Yeah, of... I think they were. I think, I think they were a little bit frightened of him, frightened yeah. of his fame, frightened him of his, you know, of his status, with, you know, within England. But FA, you know, were the same. They were the same. It's just the way yeah. it was. You know, a bit of the old school tie, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Um, we've got another video question that's come in. Um, and this is, is from from my younger brother, Ben. So if uh, you press the button, please do. Hello, Mr. Carr. Uh, my name's Ben. Pleasure to be able to ask you a question or two. And I hope you're keeping well. So my questions to you are, obviously you're a football fan, but what other hobbies do you have? What other sports do you enjoy watching or playing i would say when you was a younger man i don't, I don't want to be disrespectful so uh you might be playing sport at the moment but uh what other sports do you enjoy playing and obviously being an extender what's your favorite pie and mash shop let's start with a pie and mash shop because where i lived at bow yep devon's road off devon's road Mm-hmm. And at the top of Devon's Road, where Bow Road meets uh, Devon's Road, basically, where Bow Church is, and, and, yep. the, and, and there's a statue of Gladstone outside, which used to be the public toilets. Right up the shit that used to be a pie and mash shop. That was my favourite pie and mash shop. And I think it moved to Langstone in the end, the same people, where they developed that, that area. So that was my favourite pie and mash shop. But I occasionally go to uh, a pub in Stock, in uh, near Billericay, and it's called the Hoop, and they do Maureen's pie and mash from Poplar. Oh, good so choice. W- whenever I go into into, into the uh, into the Hoop, not every single time, but um, I, I like to have you know two pies, double mash, you know, with plenty of liquor. So that's the first bit answered. Um, what sports I enjoy? I, I used to like playing golf, but I've had problems with my hands. You know, I, I, I've had a a condition called dupatrons, which you know your fingers bend over like that, and you get it's like if you don't have them treated, you get like a claw hand. So I've had a couple. You can see my perhaps my little finger on this hand. You see how bent it is, and um, I've had them straightened. I've had a couple of operations in the last year, so I have my fingers 
operated on and straightened. And I, I've, I've lost grip. So I, I find it hard to hold the club now. So, yeah. Um, so that, that's one the one big sport I enjoyed. And I, I used to enjoy when I was young a bit of tennis. And again, a similar problem. Um, what sports I enjoy? Obviously, football goes without saying. And to be honest, I'm not really into watching loads of other sports. I'll, I'll watch, um, say, like a, 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 a test match. If mm-hmm. if there was like it was the, it was the fifth match and whoever won it won the series or something I'd watch that yeah. but I wouldn't watch it I wouldn't watch the series religiously and like the tennis I'd wait till it got to the later stages of the tennis and I'd watch it but I don't I haven't got the patience to sit down and watch you know three hours of tennis and I want to get up and do things and my yeah. biggest hobby my biggest hobby is and I've always had it uh, is gardening uh, I like to get out of the garden do a bit of gardening cut the grass and try and shape things and. And I've always done that, and I always found on a we used to have academy games Saturday morning, Sunday morning, because what football was seven days a week basically. And I always liked to go out in the garden when I come out from football on a Sunday morning, uh, and go out the garden for an hour because I used to it just to help me collect my thoughts, and I've always um, and helped me relax. Um, so gardening is, is is my big hobby, and I do like a bit of DIY. I, I, I will t- I mess up a lot, but I do turn me in and, and try little bits here and there. Yeah, so. That's that's basically my life now. <laughs> well, uh, it, um, until the bit where you said you mess up now and again, I was going to say, well, I tell you what, if you fancy a few odd jobs around here, mate, <laughs> I can I can sort of like I can relieve your boredom. It's not a problem. <laughs> no, I'm not that good, but I'll, I'll try oh, most I'll things and, and see how it comes out. Oh well, God loves a trier. Yeah. Um, Duke, we've uh, got any more questions in the live chat, mate? Ah, Daryl asks. Did Lampard actually shine in the academy, or was it his surname and then his hard work that got him his amazing career? Hmm. That's that's a myth. It's all a myth in terms of he only got where he got because he was a Lampard and Frank was Harry's assistant. Because you know, I don't mind saying so now that when Frank was in the academy. I wouldn't say, I said it earlier, he wasn't the best player in the team. Frank would admit it himself, he wasn't the best player in the team. But what he did have, he could pass it one and two touch. He had great vision and could get forward and score goals. And he wasn't the quickest. He wasn't the the most mobile as a very young kid. But you always felt he had a chance because of his technical abilities. Um. When he, when he became an apprentice and then a young professional, that's when his dedication, his hard work, that's what got him his career and his, his commitment and desire. And that was driven into him by his dad from a very young age when he used to play in Gideon Park. Uh, Gideon Park Rangers, I think he played for, or a team like that, where his dad was always very, very demanding. Very, very demanding of him, saying you've got to work hard, you've got to do this, you don't do that, you, you're not not as good at you know you're not as good as that, you've got to practice that. And he'd he'd make him practice, so he he got that habit of working at his game, working at his weaknesses. And Frank Lampard used to say to me, Frank Senior used to say to me, "Is Frank good enough? Is he going to make it?" So none of us really knew. And I go and I he was with the. He was, I think he was with me with the youth team at the time. And I said, well, the boy that's playing for England youth is a boy named Nigel Quasi. I said, and he's playing in midfield for England youth. And then we eventually signed Nigel Quasi then he, from Portsmouth or somewhere, but he was a QPR then. And I said, he's as good as him. And, um, and I don't know why he don't get picked for England. And um, he, was, he was a good player. But if you said to me, it was 14, 15, will he go on and be the leading goal scorer for Chelsea Football Club in the Premier League and win two European Cups and X amount of this and 100 and odd caps, I'd have gone, ooh, that's a, that's a, that's a statement to make. Setting the bar high. But he did. He did. And that was because of his dad's commitment, his dad's mm. drive, and his own commitment and work, uh, his commitment to hard work. Let me tell you a story. I interviewed Frank for the book that I've just written, if anyone hasn't heard yet. And um, and he told me when he was at Chelsea, 
they they uh, signed Michael Ballack from Germany, yep. who, had just, who had just won the World Cup. And he said to me, Frank, he said, I, I thought, that's it, they've bought someone at the same old place. He said, I didn't know. He said, so I wasn't one to throw me toys out of the pram and demand a move or anything like that. So he said, I decided to do one or two things. He said, I decided that when we went out training, I'd be on the opposite team to him in every game we try to play. I'd always try to be on the opposite team. If we did running and sprinting, I'd always make sure I stood alongside him and beat him. He said, if we, after training, he said, he said, I always used to stay out after training anyway and practice and do free kicks or practice whatever, shooting. <coughs> and um, Michael would stay out. He said, but I always made sure I stayed out longer than him. I never went in until he <laughs> he'd already gone in. He said, and, and I'll just, and I'll finish the sentence. I said, Frank, I know who won the battle. And, you know, it was that attitude that got him his career. And uh, I think it was unfair of the West Ham fans at that point to accuse him, you know, or accuse Harry and Frank of a little bit of nepotism and say he's only in the team because of his because of his uh, his name. But if you look at his record for West Ham and the games and goals he scored as a very young kid, 18, 19 year old, yeah, it's very good. It's very very good. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't I don't I don't go. I've never bought that that theory because you know I was part of his part of only part of his development and um yeah so i've got every admiration for frank for what he's achieved and the way he's achieved it and he's a great great example to young players yeah i, I remember an interview that i heard harry do where he turned around and said the hardest working player i ever saw was frank lampard jr he said and the only other player that i ever saw that had the same worth it work ethic was frank lampard senior yeah exactly so the apple yeah. doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? Uh, exactly. Exactly. So, okay. Um, so, Duke, I think we've got uh, another video question. Now, I, I before you hit it, though, Duke, um, just to warn you, Tony, this is about a two-minute clip. Um, I asked to I asked people to keep it short and sweet, but um, this particular one it, it actually morphed into three questions in one. So, okay. bear with it. But um, he's he's very complimentary and. and uh, I've sort of left it in its entirety because I, I think he wanted to also pay tribute to you. So, uh, Duke, there's one there oh, from Jazz okay. if you'd like to. Thank you. Hi, Tony. It's Jazz from the West Ham Irons channel. First of all, I want to thank you in the bottom of my heart on behalf of the club, the fans. You have dedicated most of your life to a service to West Ham United. Hats off to you, sir. Can't thank you enough, mate. You are proper. Your blood is proper clear and blue. So thank you on behalf of everyone. Uh, my first question, again, depending on the show, I've got two questions in case you can't answer the first one. Um, Everell LaRonde, the captain of the 1981 FA Youth Cup winning final team that included players like um, Alan Dickens. He was talked about as a future captain of the club, uh, Tony. And he suffered an appalling leg break in one of the games shortly after that, mate. People at the ground, they still are shocked and appalled and nightmare, mate. They could hear the crack of the leg all around the ground. Never the same. Played a few games for Bournemouth, especially in the Harry Radnapp's team that beat um, Man United in the FA Cup third, fourth round, 84, mate. Then he just retired. Let me know if you remember him, what the prospects were, how sad you were that it Totally ended like this, which it can, and you've seen it in your life. If you can't remember him, my second question, my main, my, my friend is, John Terry, why did he leave West Ham? Um, let me know the reasons for that. And another reason, I think we lost Tony Adams, didn't we? In his book, he mentions he wasn't too impressed by the kind of environment at West Ham. He felt Arsenal was much more professional. Yeah, so three cheeky questions. Avril Ronde. John Terry and Tony Adams leaving our clutches, mate. God bless you. Come to your eyes. Thank you again. Bottom of my heart. Jazz, I love you, Tony. There yeah, three go. good questions, yeah. In, um, of course, I remember Everett Laurent. Uh, I mean, I was with him Sunday. He was at the charity game I was at oh, I was wow. with Alan Dickens. I was with him Sunday. It's amazing. And uh, I was, he's with his wife, his young family. His, his young boy plays for Charlton. And he wasn't oh, very really? comp. Yeah, he's, 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 he's apparently, he's, apparently he's a very good player. And he wasn't very, I have to say, 
he wasn't very complimentary about his um, his time at West Ham and, and the way they treated him. So, uh, which I was disappointed to hear. But oh, anyway, yeah. that's neither in or there. Uh, yes, I remember Everald. Um, good lad. His brother. He had a brother in all. Uh, Tony Laron. Tony, yeah. Um, and um, he's up in no- up in the north somewhere. Everald tells me. But I've, yeah, I've got a lot of time. For Hi, it. Tony. It's Jazz from the West. Yeah. Don't know what all right, Jazz, I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Everall, good lad. Terrible terrible injury, as you say. Very bad injury. Curtailed his career, which is, is one of the hazards of, of the game. And, and yeah. another player that w- w- round about that time was a boy named, uh, there was Chris Ampofo and his brother Gerhard Ampofo. And uh, he had yeah. a terrible broken leg against Aston Villa. Uh, Upton Park, and and that was awful, awful. And he never played another game after that. Never played another game. So you know, a kid got you know seventeen years of age, didn't even start his career, and and it was curtailed. So yeah, ever I remember ever fondly. I was with him Sunday, and he's still as chirpy as ever. And uh, yeah, good lad. Uh, Tony Adams. Now you've got to remember, Tony Adams was a barking boy with Stevie Potts. They played in the same barking district team together. And um, Potsy and uh, both come and Tony both come training. And in them days, you could train at two or three clubs before you actually committed to sign. And Tony was training at Arsenal. So he said, oh, I'll come along to West Ham and have a look. And he, he just felt, I, I didn't agree with him, but he just felt that West Ham was a bit too, um, it was too technical and it was, it was too, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what words to use. It was, it was too much like fun, and he wanted it more serious because that's okay. the way Tony was. You know, he wanted it more serious. Now, don't get me wrong, you can still have fun and be serious, and that's what that's the you know what we try to, um, what we try to do was take the pressure off players to perform because I didn't want pressure on players that were, were fearful of doing things because they didn't want to make a mistake. So. I, I, I took that pressure off and made it a little bit more, not me personally, but the, the environment that we created a bit more, a bit more fun. Remember these kids are 12, 13 years old and he was training at Arsenal and Arsenal training at the time must have been maybe more serious, you know, do this, do that, a bit, bit more regimented. Yeah. I, maybe, I don't know because I, I wasn't watching it, but maybe Tony appreciated that more and liked it more and Arsenal probably sold him a, Sold him the sold him the club, um, but we didn't have the chance because he chose Arsenal and didn't give us a chance to sort of pitch our our bit. John Terry was another disappointment, and uh, I think I wouldn't say I take a bit of blame for that, but I think we we as the academy take a bit of blame for that because it was in the system where you signed a form from year to year. It was called the Centre of Excellence then rather than the Academy. I remember it. Was it Lillishaw, wasn't it? Yeah, Lillishaw. But they then called the Centre of Excellence. Every club had, a, had to have a Centre of Excellence hmm. that mirrored Lillishaw. And, uh, but you had to register the player from September the 1st till June the 30th. So July, August was their time to reflect on whether they wanted to stay at the club or move on. And then at the end of the, se- the, the season, when, when everybody, everybody's form was finished, mm. um, we just said, everybody, start training, second week in August. Want you all to come back, sign your forms in August for September the 1st. And everyone was going, yeah, yeah, not a problem. Yeah, lovely, lovely, lovely. But John never come back. And what had happened was, I've now since found out that Chelsea got into him. Bearing in mind, he was a midfield player then. Chelsea got into him, a scout got into him, an East London scout, and then sold him Chelsea and 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 dissed us and said, like, West Ham ain't no good, they ain't going nowhere, they ain't doing this, they ain't doing that, they don't this, they don't do this, they don't do that. And it sold they sold him Chelsea. So he, he signed for Chelsea. And I didn't know he'd signed for Chelsea until we'd come back in the summer. So in effect, what we should have done as a system is maybe got the boys to sign the forms, which was technically illegal before you should have done and put it in a drawer till the time we could register it, if you know what I mean. Mm. So that's what I'll do now. <laughs> yeah. Technically <laughs> illegal, but I bet it went on. Yeah. Yeah. Of course yeah. it did. But I, I you know, I, I, we, when I say we, 
and I'll say part of that. We didn't do that, and John Choke made his choice. But I still speak to him today. When I when we when I bump across him, he came and played in my testimonial, which was a great thing to do. And um, you know, he was he was very very good. And I'll tell you a story about John. He um, he came to the testimonial, and I said to every player that came, I had loads of players, as, you, as those that remember or seen the picture. I had too many players. I only wanted eleven. I had about twenty five. And I didn't know how. I didn't know how to. So I asked them, "Do you want any tickets for the game? Want any tickets?" So some players, oh yeah, I need two tickets for me brother and his sister and someone else. And I felt like saying, "Do you know that? You know, in the, you know, in testimonial, was everybody pays?" But I, I gave them the tickets. <laughs> so I said, to "John, how many tickets do you want, John?" And uh, he said, "What for?" He said, "You know, for your family." And he said, "No, my dad's coming." He said, he "Don't want a ticket." He said, he, "My dad told me." He said, "Don't take any tickets off Tony. Tell him I'm paying at the turnstile." I thought that was great. And then I, Frank Lampard didn't want tickets because Frank uh, was my assistant on the night. He was the manager for the team on the night. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he was uh, he, he's good deep down. He's a good lad, John, although his reputation is a bit uh, bit different. Deep down, he's a good lad. Well, they, they to be fair, neither Tony Adams nor John Terry had bad careers after they no, moved exactly. on to Pastures yeah. New. Were, were, do you know if they were both, were either of them West Ham fans growing up? Do you know? I think John was, hmm. but I can't swear to that. I'm not sure about Tony. I didn't. I mean, I see him to this day, and now and again, I bump into him at various Premier League things and and so on. And we always have a little chin chat, little chat, and he's you know, he's, just, he's you know, he don't forget the past, don't forget people that he's he's, he's come across. So no, I, I'm not sure, but it, he, he obviously is Arsenal through and through now. Yeah. But, uh, no, both had great careers. I mean, how can you argue and? You win some, you lose some. So, yeah, you can't win them all. There you go. Okay. Um, Duke, we've got any more questions in the live chat, mate? Oh, look at this from Happy Hammerette. Hope you're well, short stack. Uh, should be caught, should be swearing at me now. Um, <laughs> how would you motivate players and keep their morale high when they are under big fan pressure? I'm guessing yeah. that might have applied to, um, well, a young young Frank Lampard because he was under a lot of pressure coming through. You referenced earlier. Yeah, um, I think as regards to Frank, um, his dad would have dealt with that because obviously mm. he was the assistant, and obviously he was then going home at night w with his dad, um, or you know, or went home at night with his dad. But um, in effect, it's not easy, and and it's whether they're mentally strong enough to take the criticism when it comes your way now it depends on where the you know where the motivation is needed is it just he lacks effort is it that he's playing poorly because he lacks motivation is it because of fan pressure and they're getting on his back is it the press as they progress up the ladder press are, are questioning whether he should be in the team or not etc etc and all these pressures and part and parcel of becoming a professional footballer, even the best players in the game are under pressure. <coughs> Excuse me. Because, you know, it's an old saying, but it's very, very true. You're only as good as your last game. And um, it's not about performing last Saturday. It's about performing this Saturday. Because that's, you know, when you've got to go back on the stage and perform. It's like anyone, you know, anyone who's in that media um, spotlight, whether it's a comedian going on stage, if he don't tell the, as good a jokes as he told the night before, they're going to boo him instead of clapping him off stage. So he's got to, you know, stay motivated, though he's, he's saying the same jokes every night of the week. So so it's, it's an inward thing. It's something that can you handle it mentally? I, I always used to say to young players, look, when, when you climb in the ladder of, of success, shall we say, and you're on that first rung and you climb up a couple of rungs and you've all of a sudden you you're a youth player, but all of a sudden you're in this first team squad. And all of a sudden you get dropped and you fall off the ladder. Now, have you got the strength mentally, physically, to get back on the ladder and climb that climb it again? Because that's what you have to do every time you have a bad time. And you've got to be mentally strong. Some can't handle it. Some, you know, it takes a long, long time. Long, long time. You know, God rest his soul. And I'll, I'll just use it as an example. Remember Joey Bochamp that you signed for West Ham? Yes. From Oxford. 
he, saw, he went from Oxford, his little hometown club, came to, in, in, you know, in, in his eyes, a big, big club at West Ham. And from day one, couldn't handle it. Just couldn't handle it. Mentally couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle the banter. Couldn't handle the demands of everyday training in terms of the standard you've got to set yourself every day and get better and better and better. He couldn't handle it. And um, we had to let him go. And he ended up going to, back to Oxford or to Swindon and then Oxford, I don't know. But we, we sold him back. And um, so he was one that couldn't handle that pressure. Um, and I'm sure people pulled him to one side, and, but it didn't quite, didn't work. And, 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 and there's, then you have other players like a Frank Lampard, who he knew all the criticism was coming his way because he could hear it. He played in the first time, he could hear it. Yeah. And, you know, fans' forums would, would say this, they say that. And, but he was strong enough to come through that. The Michael Ballack story. He was strong enough to come through that, you know, and he didn't play well every, every game. He didn't play well every week, but you know, you've got to be strong mentally to come through the, the bad times mm. and um, something to do, but you need, some, uh, you need a shoulder to lean on. You need good advice. You need good people around you, whether it's your agent, whether it's your parents, whether it's your partner or whether it's one of your coaches or the manager himself. Um, and, you know, so in, in effect, you have to be their mentors. You have to be their, you know, the people that they can turn to when things are not going great. Because when things are going great, you, you don't need any help. You go out there, just do it naturally. But it's when things are not going great that you need help. And there's more in the game now. There's more help in the game now than there ever used to be. So um, uh, that, that's the way I, I used to handle it. You know, obviously, talk to them, find out the root of the problem. And uh, sometimes it's as simple as, you know, I, I, the, the distances I travel with getting into training every day is killing me. So yeah. I go into training, I'm drained. So in the end, I'll, you know, I, I, many a time, you know, I take a boy and say, look, you've got to go in the digs Monday to Friday to be, so you, you'll get up fresh and you can train properly. So because the diggers are in Romford, mm. uh, there's a house for boys that can't travel in daily basis and boys from abroad. So I, I do things like that. So yeah, there's help there, but it's 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 not easy to overcome, and it's not it's not a it's not a one conversation trick, if you like, that you can overcome it. Um, I'm just conscious, Tony. Um, are you okay just to carry on for a little bit longer? Are you you yeah, all right for yeah. time or yeah, okay, go no on for another whatever got, time. Got yeah. pl plenty more in the live chat. Um, we'll try and get through as many of them as possible. Um, Duke, next question in the live chat, please. So this is from Jamie. He asks, do you think we will ever have players rise through the ranks with the talent like Lampard, Cole, Ferdinand, Carrick, etc.? cetera? Um, I'd like to think so. Whether we would have them in the numbers, I don't know. And I suppose the last one that you could say is risen from the ranks uh, via Chelsea was uh, Declan, Declan Rice, who, yeah. we, who we took, you know, when I was still the academy manager. Um, from Chelsea when he was 13. And um, whether we'd get him in the numbers that we did, I'm not sure. I think the scouting there is so more sophisticated. And um, I'm not sure what, what West Ham, if we're talking West Ham, which we obviously are, I'm not sure of their, their recruitment process now, how many they've got, what areas they concentrate on. I don't know whether they concentrate on more on abroad or older players than younger players or whether they've got areas. I don't know. So I, I can't answer that question intimately enough to know what's going on there now. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to think so, purely from a West Ham point of view, because West Ham fans, you know, as, the, as we know, um, love a homegrown. They love a homegrown player. Yeah. And most clubs do, of course. But we've had a fantastic record over a number of years uh, with great people at the club. And I don't always include myself in that. You know, they were producing players before I, I, I took over. But we've had a great tradition. We've had a great philosophy. And I just took that on and, and grew it and developed it. And, and um, <clears throat> obviously, we had a, a great batch of, you know, the, I used to call it the conveyor belt. One goes off the conveyor belt, you know, and someone drops on the other end. One goes off goes into the first team or into the squad and someone else gets on and 
you've got to keep that conveyor belt moving. So I, I don't know what they're doing there now, but I sp I'll speak to Kevin King occasionally, and uh, Kev is quite upbeat about players in the system. He thinks there's some really good players there. The other thing is, is opportunity. Will young players today get the opportunity yeah. that they did <coughs> did for you years ago? Glenn Johnson's a good example. He got put in the team because there was no one else in effect. There was injuries. That's what happens a lot of the time. And he got in the team, did okay. And he's, I don't think he's a centre-back. I think that proved that in one or two of the games I've, I've watched. I think he's a right-back and I think he's a good squad player for a right-back. Um, I think he's got good attributes. I'd like to see him do a little bit more. And if I was there, I'd be encouraging him to take more risk with his passing forward. He plays a bit safe for me at times. This is me as a fan being critical when I'm sitting watching him. You know, if, if um, West Ham staff are listening to me, they'll be like, what do you know? Shut up. <laughs> but, um, no, I'd like to just see him get down the line a bit more, deliver more crosses in the box. Because the most successful fullbacks today are like secondary wingers. You think of yeah. Trent Alexander. Arnold and Robertson on the other side and that they push on all the time. They're always in advanced position, putting, you know, good crosses in the box. So that's what I would encourage him to work on and, and to do more of. He may be under orders, I don't know, but that's me looking from the outside. Yeah. So he's a good example of someone that uh, got an opportunity, has taken it. I think he's up to 30, 40 games now, I think, and it's, it's fantastic. And I didn't think he, he may get the opportunity at West Ham. I thought mm, he's not. He's, he's a good lad, good squad player. He's good enough to be a pro. Will he get the chance? Will he get the chance? Will he show enough to get yeah. the chance? But he obviously did, and he's taken it. Um, whether he's the long term future, it's up to him to decide that. He's got to work at his game, and like I've, all the attributes you need to push on. Yeah, I, I think that this is just my own personal opinion, Tony. I just think that because there's such pressure on most Premier League managers and and the the rewards for success and the you know, the penalty <coughs> for failure are so vast that I think if you've got a promising up and coming youth prospect coming through 16, 17, 18, whatever, it's quite difficult in some circumstances to justify putting them in the first team when the manager's job could potentially be on the line and they probably yeah. look and they go, oh, mm -hmm. we'll get a, a, a sort of like a full back that's playing in France for 20 million quid, you know, and it pushes yeah. that youth player, unless that yeah. youth player is, is something special, like a yeah. reference Trent Alexander Arnold. Um, yeah. You know, and they're sort of like, they're just so, so they're, they're probably not going to see the time of day in the first team. No, uh, uh, the route that tends to be the route nowadays is they, they have a good youth development. They go into the mm. reserves, I still call it the reserves because technically that's yeah. what it is, whatever they call the age group. And it's thing if they can't break and go out on loan um, and try to develop your reputation that way. So that is one way to do it. Players always went out on loan. Carrick went out on loan. Ferdinand went out on loan. Lampard and Glenn Johnson, as we as we featured in the kind of Millwall, um, they all went out on loan somewhere to sort of get men's football because they need men's football. Mm. And, and, you know, the rough and tumble of men's football, the physicality of men's football, they need that. That's, that's the next stage. And they've got to develop winning habits because there's no good saying, oh, winning don't matter. Winning does matter because that's that's the name of the game. If you're winning, you're good. If you're not winning, you're under pressure, as Scott Park was found out today. So um, it's, um, you know, you've got to develop that winning mentality. And winning mentality comes with a toughness, a hardness, mental strength, working hard and always looking to improve. And um, maybe alone might do that if you can't break into the team you're with. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of the of the loan system myself. I think it, it yeah, like you say, it tough it toughens players up and it, you know, yeah, lots definitely. of players down the years. I mean, you know, you referenced, you know, Rio Ferdinand, Frank Lampard, Jermaine Defoe. Jermaine at um, Bournemouth, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and sort of like even players sort of like elsewhere, David Beckham went on loan to Preston North End all those That's years right. ago before making the breakthrough at Manchester United. So I, I think it's it's something we need to utilize to better effect. That's just my humble opinion as an outsider looking in. Um, Duke, uh, we got any more in the live chat for us? Here we go. Gary Lucas says, was Tony there when Bobby Moore was still playing for West Ham? 
Yes, I was. At the, uh, just before he moved to Fulham, um, I was there. Um, obviously, I was there in 66 to 70 when I was a young player and Bobby was a player. When I went there in 73, um, I think Bobby was still on the staff then. I'm not sure what year he went to Fulham, but it must have been pre-75. So I may have been there for a, maybe one season when Bob was still playing or, you know, on the end of his career. So, yes, you know, I was I was there with Bobby. Yeah, he was... Because uh, I remember when we spoke at the um, at the bookshop and I, I asked you the question, who who were your role models growing up? Who was the players that you looked up to? And, and Bobby Moore, I believe, from yeah. memory, was the first, first name out of your mouth. Yeah, he's my idol, Bobby Moore. Very much so. And he was only a very young player when I was a kid, obviously. And, uh, yeah, he just stood out to me and just took to him straight away as, as the player to, to like, follow. If you had shirts then days, we named, I probably had more on the back of my shirt, number six. But uh, they didn't sell shirts. And only only in Bobby's shop across the road from <laughs> up in Park, yeah, selling replica shirts yeah, from Hong Kong or somewhere. Um, got any more questions in the uh, live chat, please, Duke? This is from Robert, Robert Singleton. He says, I think, do you think you... Ah, right. Okay, I think oh, I've... I've yeah. Um, you, you, do you think that you pass a resemblance for Bobby Gould? That has been mentioned to me before. I don't think so. But uh, it has been mentioned to me before. You've got a little bit of Bobby Gould about you. So I said, well, I don't see it myself. And, uh, but yeah, it has been mentioned before. Yeah. But he was at West so. Ham, wasn't he? Yeah, did, did yeah, you cross yeah, paths at any yeah, point? Yeah, yeah, I know Bobby Gould very well. Yeah, he's a good lad, really good lad, very down to earth, always smiling, always got a joke to tell. Yeah, good lad. Know him, I know him well. There you go. Um, any more in the live chat, please do plowing through. Okay, this is from Paul Hayden. He says, uh, evening, gents. Apologies if this has already been asked, but who is the most natural footballer Tony has ever coached? Yeah, it's a good question because obviously um, going right back to when I was, you know, my first year as a part-time coach, I had some really good players. Um, but I would say, most people would say it must be Joe Cole. No, not for me. The most natural player was Rio, who was naturally gifted. I, I, I couldn't teach him much. All I could do was teach him a little bit more about the game and his position and the things he should be trying to do rather than improving because he could run, he could jump, he could pass left foot, could pass right foot, he could pass short, he could pass long, he could read the game. Uh, he, you know, he, he was a natural reader of the game. I mean, I was the first person to play him at centre-half. He didn't want to play there. He was a midfield player. I was the first one to play him at centre-back because I encouraged him to break, who played free at the back, uh, which was unusual at that time. But I played three at the back just to try something different to get the best out of Rio. And I said to him, why don't you constantly break into midfield? Or, or if I was demonstrating something on a training pitch, and uh, I'd say, Rio, can you knock that ball out there and just play it out there to Joey out on the left? He'd go like this. Bang, straight in there, straight as a die. Yeah, I like that, Rio. Yeah, so he could he could do everything. Joe was obviously the one that caught the eye. He was the most exciting to watch, if you know what I mean. Oh, draw your you no, know, draw you know, draw a breath and go, oh dear, oh dear. You know, and there was natural players like Carrick and and, and so on. But Rio was the most all, all rounded player, all rounded. He's a frustrated centre forward. Rio is. <laughs> He was obviously tagged fairly early on as as the new Bobby Moore. Um, do you think that that was a tag that he ever was bogged down by, or did he did he sort of like relish that tag? No, he wasn't bogged down by it. He was too exuberant as a person, outward personality, very forceful in his opinion, not nastily, but yeah, he, he believed had his in opinion, himself. believed in himself. And uh, that, that wouldn't bother him. It'd be it'd be an honour. He'd go, oh, lovely. I'd love that. Love that. He'd love it. 
that he you know be, they could be compared to Bobby. But no, he was um, naturally gifted. It was it was a, for me. If you ever saw a play and you thought this kid's going to go all the way, uh, which you, I didn't say very often, you'd you'd label Rio as one of those. Fair. Okay, so uh, next question in the live chat, please do. This is from Gary Lucas. How does Tony feel about football academies recruiting boys as young as six? To me, it seems ridiculous. Yeah, I think you get... I, I agree, by the way. I think it's ridiculous. But you get caught in the trap. And this is what happens when you're at a football club. You get caught in the trap of finding and developing the talent in your area. Because bearing in mind, at that age, they can't sign them at six. They can't sign them until they're eight. But... <clears throat> What you have to do is identify where the talent is in your area because you can only recruit from one hour's distance from your academy site. So West Ham Academy is in Romford, so they can only recruit from one hour's distance. And when you put a registration into the FA, the FA do a, an AA mileage check. And if that mileage check and time check is more than one hour, they refuse the regis registration. So what it is, so you don't lose. So if you, so, so you say I'm the academy manager at West Ham. I'm not going to recruit any kid till they're ten. But there ain't any kids out there at ten that are going to be good enough to play in the academy. They'd be the odd late developer, of course. There will. Don't get me wrong. But all the other clubs have gobbled them up because at West Ham, Chelsea, one hour's West Ham area. Tottenham, one hour's in West Ham's area. You know, QPR, Charlton, Millwall, who run decent academies. They're all in our area. Tottenham Hotspur, all in our area. So even though we think that's our area, we've, it's not. We ain't exclusive. Yeah. So you have to, you have to identify them young, bring them into the system, and make sure that the ones that are going to be signed at eight are already ingrained West Ham, hmm. because, because what you've got to remember, those six, seven-year-olds are training at West Ham on a Monday. Arson on a Tuesday, Tottenham on a Wednesday, because there's no limit at that age of what wow. you can, what, what, you know, what you can, how, how many clubs you can go to, because you're not registered. You're probably registered with your your weekends club, your youth club, yeah. on a Sunday morning, Saturday morning. So though I don't agree with it, I think you get caught in the system that if you don't do it, you lose out on the players that's in your area, because the hardest part is identifying them. That's the hardest part, finding them, being first. Because those that have got more money than West Ham have got more scouts. So the more scouts you've got, the more areas you can cover. So the more areas you can cover, the more players you're going to see. And the more players you're going to see, the more chance you've got to find in mm. the little nuggets. <clears throat> so you're kind it's, of forced into it, even though you you know that you probably yeah. It, yeah. it's probably something you shouldn't do. You're yeah. forced into it because everybody else is at it. Yeah, yeah. You've got to just remember that Tiger Woods was swinging a golf club when he was four. True. And... Uh, and the Serena Williams and Venus Williams, you know, were being hawked around tennis clubs when they were a very, very young age. Um, and that eventually led to greatness. Now, it won't happen in every kid, but that's the start, I'm afraid. And and the parents get caught up in the dream. Yeah. Um, got any more questions in the live chat for us, Duke? This is from Kent Hammers again. He says, Tony... At some point, do you think Mark Noble will have a big role to play at West Ham in the future? Um, I think he'll always. I think there'll be always be a role for him. What what that role may be will depend on two things. Um, if you're talking about a big role, will he be involved in coaching, managing the first team? I think that's a big ask at this point. Um, will he be involved in an ambassadorial role? That's easy. Yes is the answer to that. That would if if the thing is if Mark wants to do it, he's got business interests. I know he wants a break from the game. He told me that he wants a break from the game. Um, I'm not sure he's, he's going to games at the moment. I'm sure he does, but you know that's only once a week going to watch a game. But um, I'm sure he'll have some role to play. How big it will be or when it will be, I don't know. That's up to two factors. You know, management, the board. There'll be three factors and Mark himself. But uh, it'll be sad that if he walks away and has no further involvement, but I'm almost positive that he'll have some involvement. How big? I don't know. 
Yeah, I, I think it would be it would be something I would find very, very strange if he doesn't have any involvement in West Ham going forwards at some point of his own yeah. choosing. But uh, his, his young boy's training at the academy. Yeah. So he's going to be around the place. So, yeah. Okay, watch this so, space. Is, I think watch this space is that one. Absolutely. Um, next question, please, Duke. So this is from Miss Hammerett, and she asks, what would you say to Rice to get him to become a more commanding captain that the squad needs? Do you, mm. do you think he's, well, I suppose the question is, do you think he isn't a commanding captain or yeah. do you think that that's something that's slightly erroneous? Yeah, I mean, I mean, as I say, I'm not there on a day-to-day -day basis. I only see what you guys see and watch a match. Um, I think he shows enough... Um, ambition on the pitch in terms of the example he sets. I think he sets a great example. Um, how verbal he is mm. or how aggressive he is in that verbal where Mark was would always point a finger, whether it's in the dressing room or on the pitch, you know, he'd point a finger at someone if they made a, you know, they were sloppy or did do Mark someone, he'd, you know, he'd, he'd dig them out. Mm. Whether uh, Declan, um, does that or is capable of that, I don't know. But I think as a captain, what I would demand is set the good set a right example on the training pitch, in the dressing room, on a match day. Set a good example. If you need to if you've got an issue with somebody on the pitch, it may it may be needed in the immediacy in terms of the point the, the point it happens. Someone should have done something. They didn't. And it was obvious. I think I would I would encourage him to say to him, hey, remind him of his responsibilities. Remind him that he should have done this or, or he didn't do that. That's part of being a captain. And the other thing is, if you've got something to say, say it at half time in the dressing room, if it's, you know, more general to the team in terms of, come on, we've got to up the pace here. We've got to push forward a bit more. We've got to push up from the back and get into the opposite because West Ham play the game in their own half at the moment. Yeah. Especially, you know, they don't play in the we don't play in the opposition's half, which is our problem. We can't get out. That's why Antonio, although he's he's not always had the best of games, he's isolated up there. He's been yeah, he's starved, has been he? isolated. He's getting starved. He gets no support, and um, so we've got to get up the pitch a bit more. Now that that comes from having the confidence to push up, not worrying about the ball in behind too early, getting closer in midfield so you can stop them playing around us. And obviously, when we win possession in the opponent's half, get into the front players quickly and join and create around the opposition's box. And they're the things, you know, I'd be speaking to the manager about if I was the captain. Hey, we need to do this, boss. We need to do that, boss. Come on, you know. And there might be underlying reasons why they don't do it. They haven't got the players that can do it. Or hopefully now with the players we've just purchased in the last, you know, this window, that we can start to develop and shape a squad that can do those things. Um, so... Again, wait and see. But Declan, should he be more commanding? Do you mean shouting, Ola? Do you are you saying he's not commanding? I, d I don't really know the answer to that, but that's how I, I would see a captain. Mm. It, it hasn't always got to be shouting and hollering to be a good captain. Yeah. Look at Bobby. Look at Bobby, Bobby Moore. Moore. Yeah, great captain. Very quiet. Never say too much. Always set examples. Or as he was running around, he just whispered to someone. Hey, He'd do it very, very quietly, very subtly. You probably wouldn't yeah. even see it. Um, but he would do it. He would do it just by example. Mm. You think, oh, Christ, if Bobby does that, I'll do it. I mean, I know I'm going back years, but when Bobby took his kit off, a lot of players now, they just throw it on the floor. Or they, they've got big baskets in the dressing room. They throw it yep. in the basket. Just then. But Bobby used to take his shirt off, pull it in the right way, fold it, lay it on his bench, take his socks, shorts and you know, to, before in the shower, fold them all up, put his tie up, so he's crepe band his tie ups, used to fold them up, put them in his boot to use them for the next game. Meticulous man. People would look at that and go, well, if Bobby's not throwing his kit on the floor, I'm not going to throw my kit on the floor. So it's setting an example. That's an old fashioned way to, to put it, mm. but you you haven't always got to be shouting and hollering to be a good captain. Yeah. And if you look at, two of the, the greatest captains that West Ham have ever had. And one of them obviously is Bobby and the other one's Bill, but yeah. they were completely different captains, weren't they? You had one like Bob that was 
very much more calm and assured and like you say wasn't someone that was sort of like bellowing out to the other players and whatever but was like a, like you say a, a leader by example yeah. and bill was very very much more he was the sort of like the more vociferous oh, yeah. type of captain oh, yeah. he was the one that would sort of like yeah. you know ball his players out on in the oh, middle not of the much, pitch or yeah. whatever so and not very more than one way to skin a cat <laughs> so no, bill, bill was very uh... If he, if he said something, he said it forcefully that you knew he meant it. And if he didn't mean it, he'd get in the dressing room after the game and, and sock you. He's done, that more, he's done that more than once. He had Ted, Ted McDougall in the bath once having a fight. I but heard about go. that. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we've got one more video to play. So, Duke, if you want to hit the, uh, the play button. Hi Tony, uh, my second question for you is, do you ever watch any of the YouTube content from guys like ourselves um, about the team or the tactics or anything? Um, do you ever watch any of the content? And if so, uh, have you got any favourites? Cheers Tony. Budgie, of course his favourite oh, is put, Forged from Iron. He's put me on the spot now and he's really put me <laughs> on the spot. I have to say, I do watch them from time to time. I'm not a regular user. But I do watch them. If there's a story about a break or we're playing poorly or we're playing very well, I'd, get, I'd just go on the odd sites, you know, Paul Tremayne, Knees Up Mother Brown, and there's a, one or two others that they fly so high. I can't remember the names of them all now, but I've got a little list that come up on the side of my computer that I'll just click the odd one or two. I can't remember all their names. But I do I do watch I do watch them. And a lot of you, a lot of you guys talk a lot of sense. Some, some of it's a bit too emotional. Because yeah. you have to try and take emotion out of it, but sometimes as a, as a, a support you can't. It, it's very emotional, especially if it's raw and it's the, you know, it was yesterday and we got stuff four 0 and we it's, yeah. it's all raw. You, you know, you're full of emotion, and uh, that's why some managers these days don't do their team talk till till Monday. Um, but I was always, always want to do it straight after the game and say what I felt and put it to bed and start again Monday. But um, no, I, I do watch them and you do talk a lot of sense. And what I, what comes across more than anything else, I do enjoy them, by the way. What comes across more than anything else of all you guys is how passionate you are to do all this and to do these sites. Uh, you know, you you must be, you know, your your wives must be, you must be driving a man, your girlfriend's <laughs> wife, partners, whoever they may be. You must drive a man because it must take loads of time and effort to sort of lock yourself away, put all these things together. So I do admire. Your, your dedication to, to the club and your dedication. And at the end of the day, you're only trying to make things better. And I always look at it from that point of view. No matter what the criticism, they're trying to make it better. As long as they don't make it personal, I think that's that's the thing for me. If you make it too personal, I'll, I'll shy away. I'll go, no, I don't like that. It's too personal. But uh, generally speaking, yeah, yeah. I, I enjoy them. I hope I, I hope I said that ones that people are listening that they like. <laughs> Checks in the post, Tony. Checks yeah. in the post. <laughs> well, I will say, Tony, you 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 kind of you, you, you attacked me there slightly. I'm I'm very emotional. I'm very. I, I do get very. Um. Yeah. I, I do. I, I I do let go sometimes. And also, you write in what you say. I mean, I, I'm currently sitting here. Um. I'm currently on a night out, uh, a night away with the missus and the kids in uh, in Warwick Castle. And I'm All currently right. sat there and telling the kids to shut up in one room. The missus behind me to wash her noise a little bit because uh, we're doing the <laughs> doing an interview with yourself. So it's um it's it's you know, but it's it's a labour of love. To be fair, I mean, Rob, you know this. I mean, we've we've done this for what nineteen months now. If we didn't enjoy it, we wouldn't do it. It's it's of one of those that you know I I grew up. I think my West Ham, my, my dad. Got me a West Ham scarf, 1980 uh, FA Cup final scarf, which I still have, actually. It's in better days. But, you know, that's, that's the best part of 40-odd years, you know. So yeah. uh, it's, I, I love this club, always have done. And, um, I personally um, want to say thank you to you. Um, you know, the, the, the other guys have mentioned it in, in, in questions and stuff. You know, the things that you've done for the club, um, over the years, you know, you, you've given us some great, um, <laughs> you've given us some great, uh, some great players that have come through that have, that have then given us great memories. Um, you know, you, you guys were talking about Glenn Johnson earlier, and Glenn Johnson, um, you know, he didn't want to leave the club, 
and Rob said, you know, I, I actually bumped into Glenn. Um, he was, he was, uh, I think, he was having a kickabout with Ben May at the time, going back a, a number of years. I was a uh, was part of a, a, a football centre, and we used to do kids parties, and I used to referee the kids parties, join in, have a kick around with the kids. And one afternoon, um, Glenn was there with with Ben May, and they were, yeah, you know, I think Ben was in in a cast. I think he'd just come back from quite a bad injury and um i asked glenn if he'd come over and you know take the picture with with the kids because the young lad whose birthday it was was a big west ham fan and we uh we, we got talking and and i you know he's i've got a palo de canio shirt of all bloody shirts that that glenn signed i've got a couple of pictures and he signed one of my brother's football boots and we were talking about you know people nosing around and asking questions about his availability and he said i don't want to leave i'm, I'm i, I want to stay at west ham and then you know, a few weeks later, he ends up at, at Chelsea, and I, I did bump into him um, a month or so after the move, and I, I asked him what happened. You know, the last time I'd had a conversation with him, he said he didn't want to leave. He said, well, to be honest with you, once the club accepted the, the offer, I realised that not necessarily that the playing staff and, and the coaching staff, but the club wanted the money more than they wanted me, and I just felt, you know, if that's the case, then it's time to move on and, and, and you know, it's, it's a shame because, you know, I, I get we're not, uh, how can I put it, um, kind of like the, the most glamorous, you know, club in the Premier League. I mean, we're, we're a massive club as, as the fans allude to every week but, you know, when, you, when you've got the likes of Manchester United and, and their, their, their pedigree, their European history, you've got Chelsea who obviously at the time were building something that, you know, that they were building, I, I, I get that we're not always going to have the ability to keep, uh, or back then had the ability to keep those, you know, the, the, the stars that came through, the Coles, the Carricks, the Lampard. I mean, for me, personally, my favourite player that you brought through was Michael Carrick. I think he, he was possibly the most underrated player that I think uh, as a midfielder that, that played in the Premier League era. I really do. I think he, he had everything that... Um, you know, the likes of Paul Scholes had. Paul Scholes is, is you know, he's deemed one of the best midfielders to have played the game in this country. I think Carrick had everything he had. He had, he had passing range. He did everything so effortless, effort, effortlessly. Um, he made it look so easy. Um, but as I say, I just want to, want to say thank you for, for everything you've given me personally as a West Ham fan with the players that have come through. Thanks, dude. And you were spot on with Glenn. West Ham needed the money. That was the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tony, okay. I'd also like to thank you, firstly, for tonight, for, for giving up your time and, you know, giving us your yeah. your your um, your um stories from your time at West Ham. And I will plug it again for anyone that's watching. This is the book. You've got the ISBN number at the, at the bottom. I can thoroughly recommend this. This is an excellent, excellent book. As I say, I'm not the quickest reader in the world. I'm on about, about page 104. I think at the minute I'm going through the interview that you did with uh, Potsy. Right, so, yeah. Um, yeah, some good That's content in there, guys. Honestly, get put put that into, your, um, into a search engine, Amazon, whatever. Have a look. Get that. You won't regret it. It's, uh, it's an excellent read. Oh, was... Was he really Mr. Singleton? I don't, I, I, <laughs> well, he was off, off the pitch, yeah. yeah. Off yeah the pitch, very yeah. much so. Off the pitch, was quiet as a mouse. Mm. On the pitch, he was a lion. He was... Uh, the story that, yeah. Bonzo was, I think, he he would be through the, the Blackwall Tunnel back, back home to his family before everybody else was sort of, like, changed and showered or whatever. Yeah, he was always... Yeah, after the game, home game, he was in his car away, quick God. as he could. Yeah, it was Bill. <laughs> Very much a family man. Very much a family man. And sadly, he lost his wife last year. And oh. terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. Terrible. Oh. Uh, no, that's, that's uh, terrible. I, I wasn't aware of that, Tony. So, yeah, um, yeah, my condolences on his loss. But, um, Tony, again, like I say, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. Very sincerely okay, for your time. Duke, Rob, lovely. Um, and like I say, and again, as, as the others have said, for, for your service to, to the club and... Uh, I might, I might see you around at the London Stadium one day. You never know. Yeah, luck. yeah, um, yeah. I'll get to the, uh, and I'll, I'll, the odd I'll game get here and there. Point. I'll get you yeah. a point, even if it's seven pounds sixty. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm I'm going to hit Cheers, the end guys. credits and uh, come on, you irons. <laughs>